TV7 Israel News is made possible thanks to your generous donations. Shalom and good evening. This is TV7 Israel News broadcast to you from Jerusalem and in today's top stories. The United States urges Israel to resolve its internal strife by reaching a compromise on the judicial reform as soon as possible. While Iran claims responsibility for the strike on U.S. forces in Syria, the U.S. Defense Department highlights that it does not see conflict or war with Iran. Unidentified aircraft strike Iranian targets in the vicinity of Damascus early this morning in an attack which Syria attributes to Israel. Israel's defense establishment continues to root out terror elements throughout the West Bank districts of Judea, Samaria and the Jordan Valley, while in tandem making every effort to ensure freedom of movement to uninvolved civilians seeking to worship during the highly contentious month of Ramadan. Since Monday, as part of Operation Wazebreaker, IDF, ISA or Shin Bet and Border Police Special Operations Units conducted extensive counter-terror activity throughout the aforementioned territories, during which a total of 43 suspected terror operatives were apprehended. Despite multiple instances of exchanges of fire as well as explosives, Molotov cocktails, rocks and other objects that were hurled in the direction of the Israeli forces, there were thankfully no reports of any injuries. Meanwhile, during a commendation ceremony awarding IDF troops who excelled in the line of duty, Chief of General Staff Lieutenant General Hiltzi Alevi highlighted the importance of striving for excellence in the face of threats which are directed at the State of Israel. General Halevi also seized the opportunity to underscore the crucial necessity to keep the IDF impartial in matters related to public debate. <laughs> כולם אזרחי השורה הראשונה. וזוהי מצוינות בעת הזאת. להחזיק את המסגרת מבצעת ומלוכדת, ובמיוחד בימים קשים. זהו צו השעה. מצוינות של רעות בצהל, פירושה לדעת לחיות עם מחלוקת, ולא לערב אותה בתוך השיח במדים. It is worth noting that while preliminary negotiations on seeking out broad consensus on a judicial reform in Israel, the United States has become increasingly vocal on the need to reach a compromise as soon as possible. After initially calling on the Israeli government to reach broad consensus, President Joe Biden, whose administration champions progressive and woke agendas among others, voiced hope that Prime Minister Bimi Netanyahu would ultimately walk away from reforming the judiciary since it aims to mitigate the institution's legal activism, which is progressive in nature. And while the president's remarks infuriated members of the governing coalition in Israel, Prime Minister Netanyahu instructed them to avoid commenting on the matter. Separately, in remarks to the U.S.-initiated Summit for Democracy, the Israeli Premier stressed that while Israel and the United States have had their occasional differences, the alliance between the two countries is unshakable. Moreover, Netanyahu emphasized that Israel was and will remain a liberal democracy with equal rights for all. As befits a democratic country, we currently have a robust public debate about proposed democratic reforms. But let me make it clear. We will always ensure a strong and independent judiciary, and we seek to safeguard the balance of power between the three branches of government that is the cornerstone of democracy. We will continue to protect and guarantee the full rights of all Israeli citizens. Israel is and will always remain a beacon of freedom, a light unto the nations. It is worth noting that during a phone conversation between Israeli National Security Council Director Tzachia Negbi and his American counterpart John O'Sullivan, the latter highlighted that while Washington aspires to see Jerusalem reach understandings, it would not involve itself in all that relates to the content of an agreement, a point subsequently reiterated by the U.S. National Security Council spokesman John Kirby during a White House press briefing. We obviously urge Israeli leaders to, to come up with a compromise as soon as possible, and the president's comments yesterday about walking away from it are perfectly consistent with, with uh, finding a compromise 
that, um, uh, that again, preserves checks and balances in Israel. Both Israeli and American officials have told TV7 that the main reason behind the voiced urgency to resolve Israel's internal dispute includes a dramatic rise in the threat emanating from the Islamic Republic of Iran. During a Senate Armed Services Committee hearing, U.S. military chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, once again highlighted the threat emanating from Tehran, which includes repeated attacks with deadly consequences by the RGC-backed militias in Syria against U.S. forces just last week. Iran threatens to push the Middle East into regional instability by supporting terrorists and proxy forces, as we recently saw. Just last week, Iranian-aligned groups killed one American and injured seven in attacks on coalition bases in Syria. We acted immediately to defend our troops, and we will continue to counter terrorist threats in the region and anywhere else we find them. And Iran has taken actions also to improve its capabilities to produce a nuclear weapon. From the time of an Iranian decision, Iran could produce enough fissile material for a nuclear weapon in less than two weeks, and it would only take several months thereafter to produce an actual nuclear weapon. The United States remains committed as a matter of policy that Iran will not have a nuclear weapon. The United States military has developed multiple options for our national leadership to consider if or when Iran decides to develop a nuclear weapon. It is worth highlighting that while the United States responded to the attack by Iranian proxies in Syria, which killed one American contractor and wounded five U.S. service members, the U.S. failed to respond to a subsequent attack by Iranian proxies the following day. How many attacks has Iran or its proxies launched against American positions in Iran and Syria uh, since Joe Biden took office? It's been uh, about 83 attacks, I think. Uh, since uh, in, in the last several years. That's a lot of attacks over two years. How many times have we retaliated against Iran or its proxies? We, we've launched four major strikes, Senator, but now, an attack can consist of a number of things. It can consist of, um, you know, a rocket that's fired in the direction of one of our bases, I, but not effective. Mi Mr. Secretary, I'm well aware of what an attack could, could entail. So we're so 79 and four is Iran's record right now. And our four attacks have not been against Iran, right? They've been against Iran's proxies in Iraq or Syria or elsewhere. Is that well, correct? Well, this last attack was against uh, IRGC Quds Force uh, infrastructure. And, uh, okay. Um, and after we retaliated, Iran attacked us again, injuring another American, didn't it? They did. And have we retaliated for that attack on Friday? We have not yet, Senator. So what kind of signal do we think this sends to Iran when they can attack us 83 times since Joe Biden has become president and we only respond four? It is worth noting that following the second attack on U.S. forces, which wounded another American service member, Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Pat Ryder highlighted that while the U.S. reserves the right to respond to the Iranian attack, it does not see conflict or war with Iran. Uh, we don't see conflict or war with Iran. Uh, our focus in Syria is on the enduring defeat of ISIS. You know, unfortunately, uh, what you see in this situation are these uh, Iranian-backed groups, not only in Syria, uh, but conducting operations in the Strait of Hormuz, in the Gulf, uh, in Iraq, uh, conducting destabilizing operations that are meant to export terror and instability. We do not seek a wider conflict, and so we will that said, if our people are threatened, we will continue to respond appropriately and proportionately. Meanwhile, in Moscow, following a meeting with Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, Iran's top diplomat, Hassan Amir Abdullahian, claimed responsibility for the second attack on U.S. forces, while insisting that the first attack was done by militants not affiliated with the Islamic Republic, despite U.S. intelligence concretely indicating otherwise. ما هم به دنبال درگیری و ایجاد تنش نیستیم جمهوری اسلامی ایران همواره نقش سازنده و مثبت در کمک به صلح ثبات و امنیت پایدار در منطقه داشته در خصوص اتفاقات در شرق فرات اما پاسخ ما به طرف آمریکایی قاطع و روشن بود Meanwhile in Syria 
unidentified aircraft struck infrastructure housing Iranian proxy militias in the vicinity of Damascus. The aerial strike took place during the early hours of today when salvos of missiles triggered Syria's aerial defenses, which attempted to intercept the incoming projectiles over the skies of Damascus. Nevertheless, the precision-guided munitions penetrated Syria's aerial defenses and effectively destroyed its intended targets, including south of Al-Midan neighborhood, and two additional installations belonging to the RGC Quds Force in the vicinity. And while two Syrian soldiers were reportedly wounded, circulating reports have mentioned additional casualties without providing any additional details. Meanwhile, the Damascus regime naturally blamed Israel for the attack, while the IDF spokesperson's unit did not confirm or deny its alleged involvement in response to TV7's request for comment. Thank you for watching TV7 Israel News. If you're blessed by our productions and would like help support TV7 Israel's ongoing operations, which are exclusively donation-based, Please consider making a financial contribution. You can do so at www.tv7israelnews.com. Separately, we would like to encourage you to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters worldwide, as well as for the peace of Jerusalem and salvation of Israel. I'm Jonathan Hassan, wishing you an Erev Mevorach, and God willing, we'll see you again tomorrow at the same time.